Now we're coming to the last component of the measurement systems analysis. Now there'll be some problems for you to work after this, but this will give you an introduction to the mini tab and how the mechanics of this function actually work. So since 1990, the dominant analysis tool for measurement systems analysis has been created and controlled by the Automotive Industry Action Group of the Society of Engineers. Gauge R&R study is a conservative approach towards evaluating the goodness of a measurement system. It evaluates the two things that we've seen before, the operator uh, variation component, or the reproducibility, and also the equipment variation component, or the repeatability. And then it's going to be based on an information judgment about the utility of the measurement system, or the relative goodness of the measurement system, based on some analytics that are collected during the process of measurement. And so if we take a look here, we'll see in this graphic that there's a number of different capabilities that are existing in Minitab 17, much more than we would normally talk about. The function that we're going to typically use is this gauge r and &R study crossed. And we'll find us under uh, statistics, then quality tools, then gauge study, and then gauge study or gauge study r and &R crossed. So what do we look at there? Well, we see in the mini tab window when we open this up that there are three things that we put in. We put in the part numbers, and we put in the operator or the name of the person recording it. So the part number is the thing that we're measuring. The uh, person or the operator is the person who is recording that information or making the measurement. And the measured data is the response or what they've actually recorded. The method of analysis is ANOVA, and what that does is it's going to allow us to see as much information as we possibly can, including the interaction between the parts and the measured operator. So then we'll be able to see, does the person actually measure the same part each way at the same time? Then we can take a look at the output of this, and the output is presented in a, a six-panel chart here, and we see components of variation, the range chart for the operators to see how much range there was in the operator performance, and then the run chart of the measures. And then we see response by part, so each of the 10 parts and how it's the range of the measurements, response by the operator, the measurement range for each operator, and then the interaction effect, this is the ANOVA component, where we see the operator part interaction for the measures. Now what I'm going to do is take a look at each of those independently. But before we do that, there's one thing I need to clarify in terms of measurements. One of the indicators we will get out of this is called the number of distinct categories. And what the number of distinct categories is, is talking about within the measurement scale, how many times can I actually classify the information or say that it's actually good? For instance, if I have one distinct category, this would be the equivalent of saying, was the student in their seat at class? Now, you all know you slept through a class or two, I'm sure. So it has nothing to do with the quality of your response. Physically, you were there. You got credit for being there. Okay. Now, the next question is high and low. So I'm going to break this response range into two things. And so sleeping or not sleeping. Okay. So I've got some way of identifying this. It's like a true or false type of question. So I can't then say, well, was the person sort of nodding off in the middle of things, or were they actually sound asleep or fully awake? Okay, so I'm not able to really discriminate in those student characteristics with this scale. I've got to force myself to make a choice. And so I'm going to make a choice, and if I see you nodding off, I call you sleeping. If you're not nodding off, I call you awake, and that's my personal definition. So again, this is where we get the relativity involved. Now, if I have three discriminant categories, what that means is I added the nodding character. So in the middle, I have nodding, and on the side, I have fully asleep, and then the other side, fully awake. So this is the first level where I can actually discriminate in terms of observable characteristics as I'm coding the performance of the person. With four levels, I can say, well, they were mostly awake, but they were nodding a little. Or they were nodding a lot, or fully asleep. So now I'm discriminating better. So this is like, if you will, more than just stratifying, but this is like, I now have like a multiple choice question. And it's on some sort of graded scale. So there's a ranking. If I add a neutral point in terms of medium, so then what I actually have is what's called a Likert scale. This was developed in the 1930s by the psychologist Rensis Likert. 
And what we see is the Likert scale is actually able to measure about a one and a half sigma shift between each of these. So the minimum scale requirement in terms of being able to detect the change difference is actually a five point scale. Now, is that the best? Not really. And so if we want to actually make observations and have more scientific basis, we have to do a much better job both in assigning the descriptor to each of the numbers used, as well as increasing the numbers so we can discriminate within five. So is it five high or five low? And so we would see that we would actually design those scales very differently. Now, in most of the cases, you will not be designing the scales. That's something that we would do at a black belt level. And so you're going to be a user of the measurement systems and the measurement scales rather than a designer of them. So now what we're going to do is we'll just see that we'll see that calculation coming out. Now you know how to interpret it. So let's take a look at these six different charts that are presented by Minitab. And what do they have to say? So here we see the first three. The top chart are bar charts. And we see that there is a summary here, and we see that there are two different things. There's a percent co contribution and a percent of the, the uh, uh, study variation that's coming. And if we take a look at this, we see that these are not additive to 100%. Because I have gauge R and R amount, then I have repeatability, reproducibility. But what I do see is that the data looks that it's mostly part-to-part -part variation. What we want is all part-to-part -part variation. That's the real measure. So I'm looking at this, I see that there's sort of an equal amount of reproducibility problem with the people and repeatability problem due with the equipment. And that the gauge R and R is showing that there are some issues between these things. So where are those issues happening? Well, I can take a look at the R chart by operator. What is the range across which the operators are performing? So I see here I have three different operators. And this is the range from zero to some level in terms of what they're measuring. So operator three is never getting above the middle. Operator two gets above the middle once, and operator one is actually quite variable compared to the other two operators. So there's a big difference here in terms of the measurement system, and it shows how the operators are compared to each other. Now the third chart is a little different. This chart is, is perhaps um, difficult to interpret. Many people interpret it wrongly because it's not used the way a standard control chart is used. So what we see here is this, this green line is the average in terms of the measurement system uh, in its capability to measure. The red lines are, if you will, the variation of the measurement system in the range of this. Whereas the black lines here are the actual measurements of the operators. And so what we see is what's happening is that if an operator is able to use the equipment to detect a part, that means their measurements will be going on outside of the control limits. It'll be unusual variation in terms of how we interpret a control chart. And what's happening, though, is that this is comparing two different things. It's saying, is this measurement system and its variation, plus or minus six standard deviations, able to calculate a system that people are measuring over this range. Now, goodness is seen when the chart looks like it's out of control like this. As a matter of fact, if I take those six standard deviations between the red lines, and I just sort of do an eyeball fit, and I say, okay, one, two, three, four, I can fit those four times between the highest observation and the lowest observation. And what we'll see is that is going to be the equivalent of the number of distinct categories. So that gives us an idea of the ability of this measurement system to discriminate what we're looking at. We then see the second set of three charts. So the first is the measurement in terms of the parts. And what we should see is relatively consistent grouping, and we do all the way up to part 10. And we see something is happening in the way part 10 is being measured, or that it's sort of unusual from the other parts. So if we see something like this, we might want to go examine part 10 and see, why are we getting such a wide range of measurement response for that? The second chart is the response by the operators, and we see basically they're in the same range of performance. They may not have actually assigned them uh, their measurements the same way as everybody else did, but basically it's a flat line, saying that there's no difference in their average response. In the third chart, we see the variation, and this is going to show us, is there so some sort of interaction between the parts? 
Now, the way we follow this chart is we check the black line, for instance, from one operator, and we see it's at the top, it's in the middle, it's at the top, it's at the top, it's at the top, it's in the middle, it's at the middle, it's in the top, it's in the middle, it's in the middle. So it's moving up and down. And we see the red and the green line are also moving. And this is showing that there is not consistently a one way of measuring. So there's sort of a band in which the operators are moving back and forth. Now, in addition to the graphical output, we also get in the session window. And remember, here we, here we get all of this output. So we'll describe these uh, percent contributions and study variation and we'll talk about what acceptable ranges are that are recommended by the Automotive Industry Action Group on the next PowerPoint. But if we take a look down here, we get this number of distinct categories. Remember I said, if you take the eyeball and you take a look at the six standard deviations, you fit them four times. Well, that's exactly what they calculated. You can fit that four times. So the number of distinct categories for a marginal system is four. You would like to have five or more for a good system. Now for these other two, what we see is we have this um, uh, measurement study error and, and then these uh, contribution errors. If we're looking at study volume, what we would see is we would like to have this to be less than 10%. And so this measurement system, if it's not the 10%, that's saying the total gauge R&R &R, uh, is, is less than 10%. Study contribution, we would want to see it less than 1%. So as we look at this, we say, wait a minute, you're saying exactly that you have to really change the system because you're way far off. Well, that would be the automotive industry recommendation. But the question is, is this a critical to quality performance item? Is this actually a measurement system you're using to judge the quality of the output and guarantee it to the customers? If you're not, then you might say, this is good enough for an in-process measure because it's just telling us about progress through the system and we're getting it roughly right but perhaps we need to have an improved. And so we have some judgment here that we can make in this four category and these levels where we're not quite at this level of performance. According to the Automotive Industry Action Group, they say you absolutely must change that measurement system. Now, the bias that they have is they want to force all suppliers in terms of the judgment call they make to improve the quality of their measurement systems. So what are the key actions? Well, first of all, we have to pick the right measurement and evaluate that system. Then we should map the measurement process so we understand all the work that needs to be done. So the uh, people who are collecting the data, observing it, interpreting it, are all doing the same thing. We should pay attention to what are the likely causes of measurement variation within the operators and between the operators and the procedure that they're using. Then we should co conduct the data collection in a rigorous way following a prescribed set of data uh, collection methods so that we're making sure that we're not introducing variation in the system. When we're making conclusions about the gauge r, &R we should think about what is the measurement process? What is the purpose of this measure? Why are we doing this? And then after that, we should implement the countermeasures to improve the process. Over the long term, we need to hold the gains. So when we are measuring this system time and time again, we need to come back and make sure the measurement system is still good. They can go out of calibration. People might need rechanging. My eyes might go bad. I might see no longer red, everything is gray, and you're asking me to make a color judgment, and I can't see it anymore. But what we need to do is make sure the measurement system stays sound and it's reporting with integrity. In other words, it's saying what we think it's saying. Now, I just have one final comment. This is something I want you to remember. In all of the Six Sigma studies that have begun when people have never actually done a project in the area, about 80% of the effort that they have put in place to analyze and understand the problem is occurring in the measurement phase. And this is probably one of the things where you will spend most of your time trying to deal with things. Don't be upset if you say, the computer doesn't give me the results. Sometime you're going to have to go do manual data collection. And we'll come back in our next uh, series around analysis. We'll talk about sample size, how to collect sample, how to deal with samples of data. But as we're looking at the data so far in the measurement system, we should be able to say, is the data good enough to make our judgments on? We should understand the history. We should understand, does the measurement system need to be improved? If the measurement system requires improvement at this point in time, then we should actually initiate a small project to make that improvement happen. Because when we go in the analyze phase, 
we need data integrity. We need the data to say, and we should be able to count on what it's saying and what it's doing. So when we're making changes and observing how it's working, that we actually are getting real observations about process changes and not observing measurement noise. So let's close out the measure phase here. After you go through and you do the data analysis, you should be prepared to complete the baseline. Once we've completed the baseline, then we're going to ask ourselves, what can we do about all of those things that were potential X's on that fishbone diagram or on the mind map, and how do we analyze them in the analysis phase?